Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone main sponsor of the Irish rugby team we all belong to the team of us Welcome along to Wednesday Night Rugby. We're going to be talking about the return of the UR season and also we've got an emerging Ireland squad which was named with 35 players today. They're going to play games against Griqua on the 30th of September, the Pumas on the 5th of October and the Cheetahs on the 9th of October. There is a youthful look about the squad. Uh, the only players who've already been capped at senior level, Ulster's Robert Balakoon, Connacht's Coelan Bade, we've got Munster's Shane Daly and the Leinster back row Max Deegan. But for the best part, uh, this has got a real spattering of youth players from the last two under 20 squads have been picked to go along uh, to play these games in South Africa and effectively they're going to be away for the next three weeks or so delighted to say on Wednesday Night Rugby we're joined by Liam Toland and Rory O'Connor gentlemen how are you getting on? Good, Good thanks Will Liam can I start with you about the idea of this emerging squad in many ways I think we were probably reserving judgement until we saw the 35 players who were picked now that we've seen who were picked what do you think about this emerging squad? Well, I think in the first instance, Will, uh, the fact Ireland did so unbelievably well in New Zealand in the series, I think it gives Andy Farrell a very positive bargaining chip when he's planning this season. Like, I don't know, maybe Rory will help me out a little bit. I don't know when this was first mooted, but it sounds like it just sprung out. And I think that the, the success in New Zealand certainly gives the Irish management a really strong hand in dictating this. I think it's a great idea. Um, I travelled in a, a development tour to Namibia, Zimbabwe and South Africa back in 1993 and there was a smattering of internationals, it was very similar to this, we'll say, this side. Um, great cross-section of Leinster, Munster, Ulster and Connacht players. It's a really good idea from an Irish management point of view and obviously the fact that, that there's a slightly different coaching structure in it as well will expose Simon Easterby and his kind of team into it. That all said, I think one of the words that, that I got earlier in the week was that Simon Easterby said there were con- compromises on both sides. So in terms of selection, what people ended up in selection because somebody else was being, uh, I suppose, the, the home province was saying, listen, we, we want this guy. Um, and how many people got in because of that and how many people lost out. A couple of big ones, Kieran Frawley. I've been barking on any time I've been on News Talk all last season. I'd love to see him at 10. Uh, obviously, Leinster has, <laughs> there's only one 10 every week and there's a pile of them available. I think Kieran Frawley is someone who could really, re- um, this tour could be very helpful to him. There's other players there who come back from injury, someone like a John Hodnett, Alex Kendallin, both back row players, really talented young guys. And I think you said in your build up there, uh, Will, there's eight players from the uh, the Grand Slam winning team of 2019, which straight away tells you there's youth in the side. So very exciting. I'm not so sure how the home provinces are happy with it. And player welfare, obviously, there's a lot of, there's, it's an unbelievable fixture list ahead of us uh, all the way through the end of Six Nations at the World Cup, but very exciting. Yeah, Rory, I wonder how much negotiation had to take place between the RFU and the provinces here, because a lot of the players who've been selected would probably have played in the absence of some of the frontline players on the opening few weeks of the new season, but now they're going to be effectively going into camp for a month. Yeah, I think the provinces have been very diplomatic about this on the record, but behind the scenes, there was a lot of disquiet about the way this came about. Initially, we heard that the provincial A teams may be going to South Africa to play against the Greekwas, the Pumas and the Cheetahs, who are the other Curry Cup teams in South Africa. So in the URC, Connacht are actually in South Africa at the same time and they're playing against the Bulls and the Stormers, the two teams who reached the final of the URC last year and the two strongest South African, well, the Sharks are pretty good as well, but two of the three strongest South African teams, whereas these players are going off to play against three teams who, you know, are below URC standard and initially, as I say, it was going to be the provincial A teams who went over or that was that was floated anyway. And instead, what we have is this kind of... Um, very interesting selection of players, but you know, it's not an Ireland A selection. It's not Ireland A will play New Zealand in November on the night before the, the the South Africa game, and it will be much more similar to the team that played against the Maori. This is the next uh, tranche of players down, and there's a lot of interesting names. There are a lot of players that you think you know almost are, will be part, you know, key players during the next World Cup cycle, but they're obviously sifting through them to see if there's one or two who may be able to make the grade in the next 12 months first and if they do they uh, they'll be on deck for you know they'll be they'll know the systems they'll have worked with the coaches they'll have been in the environment like Bloemfontein's a really difficult place to spend 10 days it's not the no one upset our South African uh, listeners too much but I, I wouldn't uh, say it's the biggest holiday destination in South Africa um, 
and I think they're going to be worked pretty hard. There's not a lot of distractions away from rugby over there, and it's going to be pretty intense for them. And that's all designed to try and, I think, road test them as internationals and see who's ready and who's not. And if they come back and think Nathan Doak is a test-ready player or Antoine Frisch, who Munster have signed from Bristol Bears, a French-born Irish qualified player, if they think he could step in for the for kind of November Six Nations in the World Cup, or someone like Roman Solanoa, the uh, you know Hawaiian-born prop who Leinster signed, who's played about six or seven games since he's arrived, but it is is physically you know the right prototype of player to play international rugby. He just has no experience really at the top level. If they discover one of these players and bring them back to the provinces, they'll say it's a job well done. The provinces would argue that to be better off staying with them and, and playing URC rugby. But I suppose there's been a bit of horse trading going on between who goes and who doesn't. I mean, Jack Crowley goes, but um, Munster has still have Ben Heady. You know, that's 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 definitely a trade-off. I, I, I'm sure Heady might have gone in different circumstances. So there's obviously been a bit of deal-breaking behind the scenes. Yeah, Liam, the most high-profile player going, arguably, is Robert Balakun, who was a player that, if it hadn't been for an injury tail end of the season, he could well have toured to New Zealand this summer. Absolutely, but like we got to take into account here a little bit that at elite sport level, there's an awful lot of names now pushing in, as Rory said, coming in with the eye to the next World Cup. And there's a lot of guys who are aiming for places on the World Cup this time around in 2013, and Balakun is definitely one of them. But you need a bit of luck as well. You need a bit of fortune. You need to. You need a coach that values as, as well. Um, the, the question is, if I was talking to Balakun, is given a choice, which tour would he want to be going on? Uh, the the domestic tour or this tour? And a little bit of selfishness from the players. I'm guessing that a lot of these guys won't be disappointed by selected because there's another opportunity to, to spend time with ultimately guys who are going to be selected at Irish level. So I'd see it as an opportunity. I know there'll be a little bit of kind of confusion, like he's in his mid twenties, he's already capped, you know, but that's the nature of it. You, you don't want to bring, you, you want to bring enough experience so the next guys behind them can feed in. Like ideally, if you're starting a brand new, uh, player who hasn't played in that environment. You want some structure around and having Balakun there would be very helpful to other players. So it could be that the Irish coaching system are saying, the reason why we're picking Balakun is yes, we want to see him. We want to encourage him at this level. But they might be partnering up with somebody else that won't happen in the province because they might be marrying up a, a Munster player or a Leinster player and they want to see it. So there's all sorts of combinations that, that the elite coaches are thinking about. I wonder as well, Rory, when it comes to the other players who've been capped previously that are going along, that they're known quantities with their province. Um, Quaylen Blade, Shane Daly, obviously in an area where Munster are pretty well stacked in the backs. And then in the case of Max Deegan, particularly with Leinster, maybe this is a guarantee of game time for him in a position where Leinster are really, really competitive with the amount of players they have to play in his position. Yeah, like Max Deegan was the world under-20 player of the year in 2016 and he was on the same team as James Ryan, Jacob Stockdale, Andrew Porter, Hugo Keane and Will Connors, and they've all got more caps than him. And he, he must be, I know he's had a huge, hugely serious injury after winning his first cap against England in, in Andy Farrell's first season. And that really stymied his momentum. But like he's behind Jack Conan and Caelan Doris in the number eight jersey at Leinster. And he's re, he's been offered moves to different provinces and has turned them down and, and you know has resisted that. He thinks he's good enough to start for Leinster. Is he best served? By, like He probably will play more rugby because it's the same... Like I, I, from what I understand, the provinces will have their internationals back on deck, the majority of them for rounds three and four of the URC. So Doris and Conan, injury permitting, will be available. So yeah, he'll be playing in those games. He'll be, you know, he, I don't know if he'll captain, but he'll be probably one of the leadership figures over there. And he's a player who's got the, you know, the athletic capability of, of playing international rugby. Definitely, there's no doubt about that. But, you know, he, he needs to produce over there because he needs to come back to Leinster saying, look what I did for the Ireland, the Emerging Ireland team. Look what I can do for you. You know, that's that's what players have to, how they have to look at it. He's one of the older players on the tour, a bit like um, Caelan Blade. You know, you've also got guys who, you know, James Culhan was, you know, hasn't played for Leinster yet as far as I'm aware. He's, he's part of the Leinster Academy. He, he was at the Ireland 20 last year. He's a much younger player than some of the other guys going out there. So there's a bit of a, a shift in profile between some player and some players and others. Joe McCarthy, really highly rated, was you know probably went to New Zealand thinking he might get capped in, in in the on that tour last summer, and and he's going over. I think he's him and Balakun are the ones. I think they they re, and Frawley of course are the ones they really think can can make the step up. 
So yeah, sure. Like the players have to look at this as, as an opportunity. You know, Farrell won't be hands on, but I understand he'll be there. You know, he'll be he'll be watching closely. And you know, if you impress in this camp, if you impress these coaches, you know, November is not that, that not that far around the corner. There is an A game to play. This is this is a real chance for all of these players to impress. Yeah, McCarthy, Prendergast, Kieran Frawley were the players in the squad who played against the Maori, and all three played pretty well. Um, this is a bit of Simon Easterby from earlier today. Here's what he had to say about the role that Frawley is likely to play on this tour. I think there has to be a, a degree of flexibility, but but we feel Frawls has the potential to um, lead in 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 a number of different positions. Obviously, he's played twelve a fair bit for Leinster. Um, but we see him, uh, which he did in the in the in the Maori weeks, as being a, a guy that can lead from the front at ten, you know, lead a week. Um, you know, he'll he'll be asked um, in in the, the next few weeks to do a slightly different role to what he was doing in New Zealand because he had a lot of senior players around him. You know, we feel like he has the ability to to step up and and um, front uh, the week, lead the week as someone like you know the extreme Johnny Sexton does week in, week out, uh, and has done that for a number of years. So giving those players like Frawls the opportunity to, uh, to um, put himself at the forefront of, of, a, of a week, lead it and, and take the team uh, to, a, to a performance on a weekend in that position at 10 is, is crucial for us. Um, you know, we're still finding a little bit about Frawls and, and the way he can play. Um, you know, it's you can see that when they're playing in the URC and they're playing for their provinces, but it is slightly different. And there's not a huge difference, but it is different when you have them in your environment um, across a you know a couple of week period. And hopefully, we can we can benefit from that time, and, and Frawls can benefit from that time with us when he goes back into Leinster after this trip. Liam, it sounds from Easterby's comments there a, that effectively he's going as a ten with the cover that he can go across twelve, but they want to have a look at ten. I think that's understandable after the way he played, particularly in the second test against the Maori. And given that the third out half slot for the World Cup squad is pretty much wide open right now. Well, Will, you kind of summarise it well yourself there. If there is any question mark over the validity of this tour, when you hear the head coach speaking about the importance of a pivotal position, like if nothing else, if if this tour provides Andy Farrell and his management with a credible succession line, beyond Johnny Sexton, I think, I don't know how much the tour is costing and ultimately who's paying for it, but that would be a phenomenal return if Kieran Frawley comes back, not just as a 10, but as a man, as a leader, as a guy who's, like, most of us watch the game at the weekend and that's it, but there's there's so much, like Rory mentioned about Max Deegan there, resisting the temptation going to another province. Like, the value of being in the Leinster environment week in, week out, is enormously important, even though you might get less rugby. And here's an example from an Irish environment point of view, that the value of, of Frawley going out there and be seen to man up, um, and that doesn't mean he needs to shout and roar and be bully, but but in the sense that probably something about Carberry at times, you would say, for all his talent, all his skill, uh, is he really controlling the fixture? And you get a sense from what uh, Andy Farrell is saying there. He wants the next 10 to be able not just to control the fixture, but control the week. And if Raleigh can do that, like, Chicas, that's some commentary from your coach or the Irish coach before you go out on the tour. There's a lot of pressure on him. But there's other advantages to the tour. But certainly if, if that happens and Frawley is comfortable doing that, well, boy, we've got a, I think we have a serious player in our hands anyway, but that would really copper fasten it. Yeah, Rory, Ron Nogara said to us many Fridays on OTB AM that he loves Frawley, loves the idea of Frawley being a potential playmaking 10, feels that maybe he suffered because of his versatility to a certain extent, that he can play in midfield as well. This is a chance for Frawley to put himself front and centre in the out-half position here. Yeah, because you know, I was just checking there the Leinster injury bulletin while Liam was speaking, and Harry Byrne is fit, and Harry Byrne has won caps under Randy Farrell and went to the New Zealand tour, we think, as the third choice number 10 and, you know, picked up an injury over there and came back having watched Kieran Frawley lead the back line in, in two games against the Murray. And now Harry Byrne is at Leinster while Frawley's off with this emerging Ireland squad. Harry Byrne's at Leinster at a time where Johnny Sexton is going to be reintegrated back into the team at some stage. And Ross Byrne, his older brother, is, is still there and is still, we think, higher up the pecking order based on his Leinster uh, 
minutes to date. So has Kieran Foley moved ahead of Harry Byrne now in the pecking order? Is that what we're to read into this? Is this an opportunity for Jack Rowdy to to do the same? You know, like this is this this time in this camp, it's a really difficult delicate sorry, de- delicate balancing act for these players because Byrne may have a couple of really good URC games to play in and, and he may, you know, continue to be ahead of Frawley. But for 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 Frawley, it's a real chance and a, and a, a real opportunity. And, and like I will be in agreement. Like Luke Fitzgerald's been banging on about Frawley for for years about how he should be playing ten, and he's wasted a twelve. And you look at him, and you know physically he's very robust. He plays a lot of games. I know he's had some injuries, but he, he looks, and and maybe a stint at twelve helps in this regard. He looks like the closest thing that there is to Johnny Sexton physically. You know, as a defensive number ten, and that's the most underrated side of Johnny Sexton's game. So. Yeah, sure, there's loads of parts to the game that he has to improve on if he's ever going to be like Johnny Sexton. And obviously, we're not going to replace Johnny Sexton like for like whenever he does retire. But for all, he has a lot of the attributes you need to be a world-class, top-class 10. He's in a province where it's incredibly um, incredibly competitive and there's more you know, there's more really good 10s coming through at the academy level at the moment. So he's got to grasp his chance when it comes. And Leo Cullen was speaking on Monday. He said, look, if any of these guys want to, want to play 10 for Leinster, they've got to be better than Johnny Sexton. And that's an incredible challenge to lay down. But at some stage, someone's got to do what Johnny Sexton did to Ron O'Gara all those years ago and put it up to him. Connacht have a new captain this year as well, Eamon, Jack Carthy. And I was reading his comments from during the week about he said he wants to have a big season. He feels the World Cup is still potentially there. He mentioned the fact he bolted to the World Cup in 2019 on the back of his provincial form. He's going to have a huge leadership role now as uh, Connacht's actual captain. With the door being open for a third out half, is Jack Carthy good enough to get back in the picture again? I got a sense that the coaches, uh, and again, this goes back to what I was saying earlier on, Will, that there is an element of luck required at the at elite level, and you need coaches who back your style. I got a sense that that Jack might not be the flavour of the month in that sense. Um, you look at the window from Connacht's point of view, they have a really, really tough few opening weeks in their season. I think Gavin Thornbury coming back in the second row, who hasn't played as much rugby as he'd like, I think he's a huge addition He's like a new signing in, if you like, for Connacht. It's a big few weeks for, for Jack, um, and I'm not so sure the coaches see him as that. I get a sense, just listening to Andy Farrell, the way he's talking about Kieran Frawley, you get a sense that he's looking for someone to step up and take over. Now, he's answering a question to journalists, is he going to be overly honest? But I think Andy Farrell, particularly kind of if you just you know you can tell a lot from what he says and doesn't say so i think that that jack may be behind at, at this point in time mm. carthy went for surgery rory during the summer he had a troublesome wrist injury and finally got it sorted out so in, in many ways that probably answered the question of whether he could go to new zealand or not that he went to surgery um but he seems to have always been kind of on the outside under andy farrell for the best part he's been up for squads when people have got injured but for the best part he's been looking in since andy farrell took over yeah, he has. He was involved in the the kind of post COVID behind closed doors stretch, and he, um, I remember he was twenty fourth man over in Paris and that Six Nations decider back in twenty twenty, and then he was out of the squad for for a good chunk as as Billy Burns and Ross Byrne got goals. But he was the one who was called up last year when when Ireland needed a third choice ten, and he came off the bench in, in Paris and, and won his first cap since that World Cup in twenty nineteen, which I'm sure was a huge personal milestone, and and it was only a couple of minutes and. I know the the pass that he threw out to Dan Sheen in the last minute was used, you know, used against him in the analysis. But I quite admired the fact that he went and threw that pass. That you know, it didn't come off, but he saw the space and he went for it and he had the confidence to do it. He spoke at the URC launch last week and, and he was actually a bit down on the fact that he's you know he's turning thirty around now. I think it might have been this week. I think that could work in his favour. He, he's experienced. He's been through an awful lot. And he is a confidence player who, when he's on form, is very, very good. And he has bad days. And Ron Nagara pointed out um, that bad day against Edinburgh last year. And Carty was hurt by that criticism. But, you know, maybe that message might have got through to him. If he is consistently excellent for Connacht and he is leading them to on an unexpected, an unexpectedly good season, the Irish coaches will take note of, of it. And he, he is young enough, even though he's over, he's over 30 now. He's, you know, he's, he's a lot younger than the co- current captain. Um he's showing leadership with Connacht if he's able to be consistently performing in a winning Connacht team and driving that team and showing all the things that Andy Farrell wants to see from him I see no reason why he wouldn't go to the World Cup next year because really below Johnny Sexton I think it's all up for grabs you know Joey Carberry's under pressure at Munster there's a new coaching ticket in there I think it'll be really interesting to see how he responds to what Mike Prendergast wants to do Prendergast's been working with Finn Russell for the last couple of years can he can he get the best tune out of Joey Carberry who really hasn't been in great form since he came back from those injuries 
he's got Ben Healy and Jack Crowley who's going on this emerging tour chomping at the bit to try and take his jersey so he needs to mind his own house first I don't think you could accurately pick the three out halves who'll go to the next year's World Cup at this remove I think there's too much rugby to be played and it's way way too open at this stage Yeah rugby here and off the ball with thanks to Vodafone main sponsor of the Irish rugby team we all belong to the team of us picking up the monster point there Liam and the style that might be slightly different with Prendergast and Leamy coming in as part of the management team for this coming year uh, with their new head coach and Graham Roundtree are we going to see maybe the best out of Chris Farrell as well? I mean, it probably to see where Fekatau is going to fit into that midfield alongside him. I felt in a way he probably didn't flourish with Dale Ande beside him. And the whole idea, as Rory mentioned, they'll want to get more out of their backs with this new coaching team. They will. And I, forgive me, but like I think as we watch the, the Munster rugby template evolve yet again, I think we have to forgive the players um, who may be starting from scratch on a whole new uh, template, uh, new coaching ticket. Obviously, there's continuity in Roundtree himself. But you got a sense for the last four or five months of the season, as soon as the previous coach announced he was departing, that it was very difficult to know who was in charge. It was very difficult to know what tactics they were playing. In moments in certain games, they looked sensational. And then they, they were dragged back down into the trenches again. So when I'm watching them now, is Roundtree going to, a little like Leo Cullen did a few seasons ago, start backing the younger players, in which case Ben Healy or, or Crowley come into play? Um, there's a lot of other players. There's, there's like Sir Tom O'Hearn and these guys as well. So there's no lack of ability and talent. But what game plan are they going to play? What style are they going to play? Is it too lazy of us to conclude that Roundtree, because of his background in, in England and, and Leicester and that, that he's going to play a certain style? Or is Prendergast going to get a big voice in how they're playing? And it's really, really interesting. But I do for, I do have some sympathy for the players that it's yet another pre-season with another new set of coaches, albeit Lamy, etc. These are legends of the game. I'd be surprised if they find the rhythm of their new game plan immediately. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see how that impacts um, selection coming into the November series, for example. Yeah, that... will, K- will Casey at scrum half and like that, like that little scrum half? Does Casey kind of get a bit more time? Uh, who's going to be the starting out half? What's the midfield partnership going to be? What's the back three going? To... Like, there's a lot of you know, there's a lot of talent there. So we don't know the best combinations yet. Whereas you look at the other provinces, uh, seem to be a bit more settled. Yeah, their game against Cardiff moved to Saturday now five past three because of uh, King Charles III's uh, visit to Wales this coming Friday. So that game was put back uh, to Saturday. Um, Roy, that's an interesting question around what happens now with Casey and Murray because Conor Murray's had to get used to a different role with Ireland as well with Jameson Gibson Park being the first choice number nine. So he's now become the impact player. I wonder, will there be a temptation for the new Munster coaching ticket to give Craig Casey a chance now to play quite a bit of rugby from the front this season? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, Conor Murray remains centrally contracted and firmly part of Andy Farrell's plans. And he's been he's, he's still seen as a very senior player in the Munster setup. And wh- the way Van Gran and Larkham used him over the last couple of years was as a kind of that calming influence over the first hour. And then they bring Casey on to try and bring a bit of pace into the game, albeit they used to bring Casey on too often and he'd have to box kick and try to follow a, a game plan. Whereas there's some sense in having kind of Murray run the game sensibly for an hour and then send some chaos on with, with Casey for 20 minutes to go. But Casey's, like, he's the third choice Ireland scrum half at the moment. He may be disappointed that he's not going off in this emerging tour as one of the senior men and, and given a chance to kind of show what he can do there because he's he's been in a lot of Ireland training sessions over the last couple of years. But if he wants to jump Murray at international level, he's got to be starting games at, at, at provincial level and he's got to be aiming at that this season is going to be the one where he really makes the breakthrough. And, and the Prendergast template will maybe unleash him and, and allow him more freedom to to express himself and to run the game and to run and, and you know and, and to play with that Gibson Park style tempo. We hear that Munster's training is much quicker this season, that they're they're trying to play with more tempo that you know that it sounds like it's closer one of the the things I picked up from that launch last week is that everyone has been watching Ireland's game tape from the, the from the Six Nations and from the New Zealand tour. And we're going to see a lot of teams mirroring what they're doing. And and given how close the Roundtree is associated with Andy Farrell, it would be no surprise to see them moving in that direction as well. Ultimately, I think with Munster, the big question is, can they get the, the good source of ball against the biggest teams? And 
you know, Roundtree didn't do the recruitment for this season. That was done elsewhere, and he's inheriting a squad that was put together by someone else. And they signed two centres when really what they needed was a world-class tight head and or hooker, probably both. John Ryan left. He was allowed to leave. He wasn't offered a new contract. He's starting with games in the Premiership of Wasps. And what Munster have is, is Stephen Archer, a, a really solid campaigner for them over the last decade, really. One of, he's close to their most capped player ever. But beneath them are, are Keenan Knox and Roman Salanoa, who have been around for a while. They're still quite young, but they have played very, very little top-level rugby. And they're both Irish qualified. They're both physically incredibly imposing players. They're, they're specimens. They, they, they look like they, they're really the part, but they haven't played enough rugby. And they're relying, Munster are relying on the biggest days on these two young guys. And, and you know, hopefully when, when they're asked to, to swim, they swim and they don't sink. Because if they sink, there's not really any other alternative for Munster. So it's all well and good talking about Casey and Murray. But if, if the ball against the, the two losers who they play in Europe or, or the biggest teams is slow or is, or is destroyed by, by bigger French packs or South African packs, it's not going to be worth a damn to Munster. And I wonder if next season is when we're going to see the real emergence of what happens under round three and Prendergast because they'll have done their own recruitment over the course of this season and will be able to identify the gaps in their squad yeah. which I don't think was done last year Yeah I think Ireland really needs some depth in the front row as well it's uh, not helpful when you've Andrew Porter great that he can now play one and three but he's having to probably play a bit too much game time at one and three and in big games that can catch up with you particularly in the World Cup um, Liam Ulster we've got a derby this weekend we've got Ulster and Connacht to kick it off and you know, unfortunately for Connacht because of the ground remedial works at the sports ground and the artificial pitch going in they've got home comforts to the way till October before they play a game at home so they kick off on the road away to Ulster this weekend like Ulster now 18 seasons without a trophy after it slipped away from them last year played so well against Toulouse and eventually got knocked out and then Toulouse and the Stormers in such dramatic fashion in the semi-final they'll feel they're probably just away from actually winning a trophy now that has to be the aim for this season Oh absolutely um, in the first instance I really enjoy watching Ulster play um, you know, some of the stuff they play is, is super. And a lot of their Ulster players, because of the style that they're playing, are being rewarded at Irish level. So that there were some new faces in off the Ulster side playing for Ireland in, in the recent past. Uh, I do get a little bit impatient by the, I used the word lazy already tonight, but the, the sense that the Ulster pack can't ultimately dictate terms when they play in the, in the bigger, bigger games. Um but they're getting better and their game style is really, really good. What what they have to do to tweak to a winning performance remains. I think that essentially they'd be brutally disappointed they didn't make the final this year. And I think that that should be their 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 goal is get to that final. You may not win it, you may win it, but getting to a final, is, a, is it's been a long time since they were at that level. And it just gets a bit disappointing. But it's a great night. I've often been up in Raven on a Friday night and it's, it's a super place to go watch rugby. They're playing a great style of rugby and I, for one, would like to start seeing them winning uh, trophies. And Rory, Leinster go to Italy to play Zebra. It's going to probably be a fairly second or third string Leinster team. Has their squad been affected by some of the players they've actually lost in this offseason? Like when I think of Connacht and how they've recruited from Leinster and bringing in you know, Peter Dooley, you've got Adam Byrne who's gone across that way and also Josh Murphy's gone that way too to get regular rugby with Connacht this season. Are there just enough players coming through the academy in Leinster that they don't feel the loss of those players who've been in on Ireland camps? Or is their squad a little bit weaker this year for the departures they've had this summer? Oh, well, I can hear the hells of derision coming from three provinces as we take out our violins for the Leinster, for Leinster losing a few players. <laughs> it's the strongest squad in the country still. I know Devin Toner and Sean Cronin have retired and that's a massive amount of experience gone. And those four players, like I thought Josh Murphy was excellent and he seemed to lose his place after he announced his, his move last year. He's a good signing for Connacht. Dooley, I've always really rated him and I believe he's had a great preseason for Connacht. So he's a real addition and I think he can really um, improve his status within the Irish setup if he if he can hit the ground running there. But Leinster always have bodies. Um, they have another, like they're still the dominant team on each of the under 20s team over the last couple of years. They're still bulk providers to all those teams. And they, they are very smart in how they identify their academy players and pick the pick the positions where they're gonna you know, where they where they're gonna be weak in a year or two when people retire and fill from within. And you know, after two weeks they play the the picture of this is, is pretty kind. They play Zebra away and Treviso at home and then they start on their derbies, but that's about the same time that the internationals start dripping back into the system and you know, they I think the, the thirteen or fourteen starters in a couple of the Ireland games last year, they've a very, very strong first team and I think we're going to see that team a fair bit in the URC in the first couple of weeks because there's no European games before the internationals so 
those those players need games before they play against South Africa in the first November game. So I wouldn't have too much uh, sympathy or concern about the Leinster squad. It's still the strongest in the competition. And even though they've lost some good players and that strength in Connacht, um, they could have even lost a few more and still been fine. Yeah, no doubt Leinster will be uh, trying to make up for last season after ending without a trophy. Uh, the games on Saturday then, Ulster against Connacht is the 7.35 kickoff at Raven Hill. You've got Cardiff against Munster, now 5 past 3 on Saturday, and Zebra against Leinster kicks off at 1pm Irish time. Gentlemen, it's been a pleasure. Thanks a million for joining us on Wednesday Night Rugby. Will, Will there's, one game you, there's one game you left out in Crosshaven. They're celebrating their 50th anniversary, and Leinster, our Munster legends are playing Irish legends for those who cannot get to any other game. Cross Haven. Nicely plugged. Hopefully people go along. Thanks a lot, lads. Cheers. Take care. Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us.